Our uh, topic here before we uh, go to lunch is a flawed theology that has been nicknamed uh, once saved, always saved. And since we are in a uh, building dedicated to or uh, it belongs to an insurance company, another name for it is called Eternal Assurance. And no, we're not going to sing a little jingle, don't worry. <laughs> the theory behind once saved, well, it's first of all, once saved, always saved, comes out of a uh, Protestant understanding of, or a misunderstanding of what salvation is. Uh, this is not true for all Protestants, since there are 40,000 different groups. It's not fair to speak of uh, Protestantism, certain teachings in certain Protestant sects as uh, across the board, but it is fair to look at some of the major teachings or major beliefs of many of the major uh, groups. And many evangelicals, many branches of Lutheranism, Methodism, Episcopalianism, many of these different groups, fundamentalists, believe in the notion that once saved, always saved, which means that once you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, that's it. You're saved. Nothing you do can take you out of heaven at that point. You're done. You're saved. That's it. Well, this creates a number of problems as you look through sacred scripture. It creates a number of problems with common sense. It creates a number of problems with how people live their lives. Let's look first at scripture. Is there scriptural support for the idea that once you're saved, you're always saved? No, there's not a shred of scriptural support for that idea. As a matter of fact, there are things in scripture that say exactly the opposite. As Catholics, you know, we sometimes get a bad rap for not being really familiar with the Bible. And it's kind of a joke, I'm not sure how much of it's the case here in the Philippines, but it is a joke in the United States that Catholics don't know the Bible and, uh, and Protestants do. Well, yeah, I'd say for the most part, Catholics don't even know their own Catholic faith. So not knowing the Bible shouldn't be that much of a surprise either. Um, I'm going to talk about the scriptures for a quick moment. Um, uh, St. Jerome said, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. No Catholic who today is worth his weight in salt should be ignorant of scriptures. You should understand where scriptures came from, how did the canon of scripture get arrived at. On our website, realcatholictv.com, we have a program called Where Did the Bible Come From? And it's a three-part, each part's about 45-minute television show explaining the development of sacred scripture. It's not a theology program, it's a history program. So when Protestants start quoting sacred scripture, you can turn around and say, excuse me, that's not your book, we wrote it. And we did. The Bible, as we have the Bible today, is a thoroughly Catholic document. It's so Catholic, in fact, that the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, what uh, Jews would call scriptures, the Old Testament <clears throat> was at the books, the order of the books was actually rearranged by the church uh, in the second and third centuries. They rearranged it. The popes, councils rearranged the order of the scripture because the Gospel of Matthew opens up with John the Baptist, the story of John the Baptist. And the last, but now, because the church has rearranged scripture, the last book of the Old Testament uh, in most publications is Malachi. Sometimes publishers take liberties and change the order of books around, but the official Bible of the church 
has the book of Malachi as the last book of the Old Testament. And it was written probably about 400 B.C. That last book matters because the last book of the Old Testament is the first book before the New Testament. And the last book of the Old Testament talks about the coming prophet who will be the herald of the Messiah. So as you follow through Christian history, you read, you know, obviously the Pentateuch, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and you read through that, and then you go through all the history and the Psalms and the wisdom books and everything, and you finish up with the book of Malachi. And the book of Malachi is sort of the final word on what happened in Jewish history uh, as far as uh, um, predating the Messiah. So you wrap up with a herald will come, and then you open up Christian scriptures, and here's the herald. The church thought it had so much uh, authority over even the books of the Old Testament that it rearranged their order, put them in a different order. When we come down to the New Testament, all of the New Testament was written by Catholic saints. Hello, Protestants. Anyone home? Catholic saints wrote the New Testament. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, St. John. St. Luke wrote the Acts of the Apostles. St. Paul wrote a third of the New Testament. The letter of St. James. John, St. John wrote the Apocalypse. Hello, it's the whole, you know, you know, hall of fame of Catholic saints. And the Catholic Church decided which books went into the New Testament. I asked this question, I think a couple of you were present at last night's uh, talk at Christ the King Parish, but most of you weren't, so for you it's new. Uh, let's see how good you are as Catholics with your scripture. Shout out the answer. How many Gospels are there? How many? <laughs> One. <laughs> there are four Gospels. How many Gospels were there before the church decided that these four were the ones? Let me say, yeah, you were at the talk last night. <laughs> there were multiple Gospels. There was, in addition to St. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there was the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Peter. They just went on and on and on. So all of these Gospels are all claiming to be Gospels. They're all claiming to be authentic. So how did we wind up with four? And how did we wind up with these four? The church decided. The church discovered, they didn't make it up, the better way to say it is the church discovered which books were inspired, which Gospels were inspired by the Holy Spirit by comparing them to the actual lived experience of the faith. And they realized this gospel is an accurate account of what Jesus said and did, and this gospel is made up. One of the examples I uh, gave last night was the Gospel of Thomas said that, when you may, some of you may have heard this story, uh, when Jesus was a little boy, None of the boys and little boys in Nazareth, would, in Nazareth would play with him. So he got mad one day and, and killed them all, turned them all into sand. Well, that doesn't sound like Jesus. And the, uh, uh, the popes and the leaders in the church, the bishops said, that's, that's not an authentic gospel. Jesus would never do that. So they dismissed it. So during the course of exploration, how old is the gospel? Was this gospel read for years and years in different uh, local churches? Was it accepted? Through all of these different inspirations guided by the Holy Spirit, the church arrived at which were the four gospels. They also arrived, they, the same method was applied to the letters, the epistles, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, book of Revelation. So we wound up with 27 books in the New Testament. In the 
Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, at the time of Jesus and the Apostles, there was a version of the Old Testament that was called the Septuagint. And that's Greek for 70 because the, the legend is that 70 translators uh, translated the Hebrew uh, scriptures from Hebrew into Greek. And that Greek uh, version, the Septuagint, became the standard. If you go to, when you read any of the New Testament accounts of, that use quotes from the Old Testament, the Old Testament that is being quoted is the Septuagint. So during Jesus' time and that first century of the church, the accepted version of the Jewish scriptures was the Septuagint, which is why, as the apostles and the other writers of the New Testament are writing the New Testament, when they go back and say, as the example I gave you in the earlier one, when Jesus says, it was not like that in the beginning. I tell you, in the beginning, God created the male and female. Uh, you know, and for this reason, a man leaves his wife. Jesus is quoting the Septuagint. If Jesus is quoting the Septuagint, that's good enough for me. And the church felt the same way. So the Septuagint became the Old Testament scriptures that the church used and still continues to use 2,000 years later today. At the end of the first century, shortly after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans and Titus's 10th legion, a number of Jewish leaders were upset that Christians were walking around using what they considered to be their sacred texts to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. So they banded together, whether they had the authority to do this or not, we don't know, but they banded together <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, decided that they would remake the Jewish scriptures. And they threw out the Septuagint and went to a version of the Old Testament scriptures where seven books are no longer present. And that new Jewish scripture is what they said, well, this is, this is the authentic Jewish scripture, but that doesn't happen until about the year 100 AD. Meanwhile, most of the Old Testament or most of the New Testament's all written now. And the bottom line was the Christians said, "Well, that's fine, Jews, if you want to do that, but we're sticking with what was the case when Jesus was around. You don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, so why should we believe your version of the Old Testament?" This is what it is. This is what we've always used. This is what our Lord used. This is what Peter and Paul and James and John and everybody else used. So that's what we're using too. And go make whatever copy you want of your own. It has nothing to do with us. And for 1,500 years, that was the case. For 1,500 years, that was the case. This was the accepted version of the Bible. It finally got all put together in about the year 400 uh, um, by Pope Damasus at the Council of Rome in 405 and had been ratified by a couple of other uh, councils also, Councils of Carthage, Council of Hippo in 398, 397. Within that five or six year period, one pope and a number of councils had all agreed, yep, this is the canon of scripture. These books, the Septuagint, these 27 books of the New Testament. Then a fellow comes along, a crazy old priest by the name of Martin Luther, and he wants to object to everything about Catholicism. He starts off with one thing, but like everything, it turns into a thousand different issues. And he says, we're not going to use that Catholic version of the Bible because that Catholic version of the Bible isn't what the Jews used. It's not the authentic thing. His problem was that the Septuagint the official version of the Old Testament has two books in it, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. And 2nd Maccabees is a scriptural text proof that there is purgatory. In 2nd Maccabees, it recounts the story of Judas Maccabees and his soldiers, Jewish soldiers, fighting to overcome the, uh, uh, the invaders. And after the battle, he goes around... They win, Maccabees win this battle, and they're going around this great big battlefield with all the fallen soldiers, his own and the enemies, 
and he notices, as they're starting to gather up his own soldiers, he notices that the sol the, his soldiers that have fallen in battle are wearing an amulet, great big chain and medal of the f uh, enemy's gods. And he sees this and he's, and he's like, oh my goodness, this is horrible. So he takes up a collection, immediately orders the living soldiers to take up a collection and send that money back to Jerusalem to the temple so that the, uh, a sacrifice could be offered for these dead soldiers. And he says, and remember, this is the Holy Spirit saying this through inspired scripture. He says, or the scripture says, of what he did, it was a good and noble act that he did so that they might be loosed from their sins. Now, they're dead. Well, if they died kind of in a traitorous state, they're not in heaven. And if they're in hell, there's no point to praying for them because they're forever. So the Jews believed hundreds of years before Christ that there was an intermediary place. And in sacred scripture, it's right there. Second Maccabees chapter 12, it says it right there. It was a good and noble thing that he did that they might be loosed from their sins. Martin Luther's objection, of course, if you remember, the thing, the, the sort of the initial uh, issue for him was indulgences and purgatory. So all of a sudden, he's trying to argue something about purgatory and say it's not real, it's not real, and everybody's saying, uh, hey, Marty, it's right here. And so he has to do something. What does he do? He says, well, I don't believe that book. Well, let's get rid of that book. Well, matter of fact, the Jews didn't have that book in their Bible originally either, so we're just going to go back to the Jewish scripture. And that's why there's a difference today between Catholic and Protestant Bibles. Protestant Bibles have 66 books in them, and Catholic Bibles have 73 books in them. A Protestant Bible is an incomplete Bible. What does that have to do with once saved, always saved? Here's what it has to do with it. The Catholic Church is the sole guaranteed interpreter of sacred scripture. The Catholic Church put the Bible together. The New Testament was written by saints of the Catholic Church. And only the Catholic Church has the opportunity or the uh, command to interpret, has the power and the authority to interpret sacred scripture. How stupid would it be if Michael was standing up here talking about his book, and he's the author of the book, and I came up to him and I said, hey, Michael, I just read your book. I thought it was really good. I know what you mean in chapter 12. Here's what you mean. And if Michael said, uh, no, Michael, that's wrong. That's not what I mean at all. And I said, shut up. I'm telling you what it means. Well, I'm the author. Well, I don't care if you're the author. I'm telling you what it means. I've interpreted it for you. Well, that's what happens when Protestants interpret sacred scripture in a manner that, that contradicts Catholic teaching. They don't have the authority, they don't have the competence, they don't have the history. My father uh, converted to the Catholic faith about four or five years before I was born. Before that, uh, before he met my mom, who was Catholic and Irish and was having none of that Protestant minister stuff, uh, uh, I've asked him, like, well, so, you know, he actually studied, really, as I said, a Protestant minister for about a year and a half, and I've asked him, uh, you know, what did you learn in Protestant seminary? It's always been a puzzle to me. What do you learn? And he said, well, we, it, it's not that we learned a different history. We just didn't learn any of the history. We went in church history up to about the year 100. We went on a coffee break and we came back and started with 1517 and Martin Luther and moved forward. He said, we just never talked about those 1,500 years in between. Well, that's three quarters of the life of the church. That's like going up to your grandfather who's, you know, 100 years old, and he is in saying, Granddad, tell me about your life. And he tells you what happened until he was 10, and then starts over at 75 and tells you, well, what happened when you were 20? Had 30, 40, 50, 60? What happened and all that? I don't know. The life of the church is 2,000 years. 
People don't get to show up to the party late and start telling you how things are. Martin Luther set the stage for Catholic theology to be undermined and undercut by a system of beliefs rooted in individual interpretation. There is no the authority in Protestantism. That's why there's 40,000 different groups. Because if I'm a Protestant minister and you're all my Sunday congregation, and I'm up here preaching away, preach, 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 and you like it, and you applaud, and you keep throwing money in the plate until one Sunday I say something you don't like, well, you leave and start your own church. And that's how Protestantism works. That's why there's 40,000 of them and counting. Heck, it looks like if you drive across the streets of Detroit, it looks like there's just 40,000 in Detroit alone. So when we're talking about interpretation of scripture and beliefs that come from those interpretations, you better hope your interpretation is correct because you build theologies and systems of beliefs around those interpretations. And after you have built those theologies and systems of beliefs, now you start making individual choices in your life based on that system of beliefs. This is why it's so important to get it right, right from the beginning. So many Protestants, not all, but of those 40,000 groups, probably 15 or 20,000 of them believe that once you accept the Lord Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, you're saved. And that's it. It doesn't matter anymore what you do. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter how you act or how you don't act. You cannot be unsaved. You're saved. This creates a whole set of goofy problems. I talked to a Baptist minister a good number of years ago as I was trying to get my head around this because immediately I thought to myself, well, that seems dumb. Really? So you just say a little prayer and that's it. For the whole rest of your life you can do whatever you want, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> well, that's a religion, sign me up. So I said to him, so let me get this right. If you say you believe in Jesus and you're saved, you can go out and become a serial killer and you still go to heaven? Yep. All right, I'm not sure how you can be breaking the Ten Commandments and still go to heaven, willfully breaking them. I was talking to another Protestant minister who was saying all of this also on, the, on a radio show and I called him up on the show and kind of got into it with him and said, so if you're saved, already saved, and this minister's name was Paul, so I used St. Paul, he said, so if you're saved already, Paul, what's the difference between you and St. Paul in heaven right now? If you're already saved, what's the difference? And he said, there is no difference. I'm like, excuse me? He's like, there is no difference. I said, wait, St. Paul, who at this very moment is looking at Jesus in the face, who is living in the life of the Blessed Trinity, which he was destined for from all eternity, you're telling me that you are as holy as he is? He said, yep, because I'm saved. I was like, well, if you're that holy, you should start writing sacred scripture. What does this do in his life? in Paul the minister's life or other people who subscribe to this, it never, it, there's no reason to move to the next step in holiness. There's no reason to grow deeper in love. If the race is over, you don't keep racing. You know, if your horse has crossed the finish line, you don't keep galloping him. You're done. And this has all kinds of social theological effects throughout society. A society that believes it's already saved is never going to do anything to advance itself. In holiness, I mean, I don't mean as a 
economy, I mean in holiness. It's never going to do anything to advance itself. A person isn't going to do that. Another great misinterpretation of Scripture was made by John Calvin. John Calvin comes up with the idea of predestination. A totally different understanding of predestination than what the Catholic Church has taught. The Catholic Church's understanding of predestination, when St. Paul uses that term in his letters, means that God has foreknowledge. It doesn't mean that God is making it happen. But in John Calvin's situation, and there are no Calvinists to speak of today. Today they're Congregationalists. But they subscribe to John Calvin's philosophies. And what do they believe? They believe that some people are born to go to heaven. I mean, we're all born to go to heaven, but they believe that some people are, God creates this person and takes the choice away from them, and they are going to heaven. Their free will doesn't matter. That's not even anti-Catholic. That's anti-Christian. That's anti-God. God gave us free will so that we can choose him. Well, that's what Calvinists believe. Well, the... If some people are born and God is going to take them to heaven regardless of what they do, well, what about the people in hell? Calvinists believe the same thing. If you're a soul in hell, you were created for hell. Now, this is crazy, but this is what happens when somebody interprets sacred scripture and misinterprets it or interprets it badly. Once saved, always saved is one of these bad interpretations of Scripture. If I'm saved, I don't have to do anything else. Oh, I might. I might go down and, you know, go help the poor or help at a soup kitchen or give money to charity. Or, but I don't have to. There's no reason for me to have to do it because I'm saved already. It's a very dangerous theology. It's very dangerous, not only for the person, but for the people standing around that person. First, it's dangerous for the person because that person no longer is capable of viewing sin in his or her life. If there's sin there, it doesn't matter because Jesus died on the cross for me and I'm saved and that's it. They miss the whole understanding of the distinction, the necessary distinction between redemption and salvation. Redemption is not salvation. Redemption is the door through which we are now able to walk and be saved. It's two different things. We were redeemed by Jesus' passion and death on the cross. But that does not save us. It redeems us. It does not save us. What saves us is applying the fruits of that redemption to ourselves, cooperating with the great graces that come to us through the redemption of the cross, and now applying them to our individual selves. That's a really big point. Simply believing that Jesus is God and died on the cross does not get you into heaven. Satan believes that. And I don't think he has a round trip ticket from heaven to hell and back. Once saved, always saved is in a really... Um, kind of complicated theological sense. You might want to write this down. In a really complicated theological sense, once saved, always saved, is stupid. <laughs> Got that? Stupid. It's stupid because it denies the truth of Christ. And yet it passes itself off as the truth of Christ. It couldn't be further from the truth of Christ. Jesus never said that. As a matter of fact, if you just use your common sense 
and look at Scripture alone, what do you have? Practically every single letter that St. Paul writes, he's writing to people who already believe that Jesus is God, that he rose from the dead. All that's, they already believe that. The Christians in Corinth, in Ephesus, in Philippi, in Rome, they already believe it. That's why he's writing letters to them. My fellow believers, I am the apostle of our Lord. They already believe that. So if they already believe that, why does he say something nice to them right at the beginning and then go on for chapters about how they have to live their lives better and they've made a shipwreck of their faith and they're losing the faith? That's because they can you can lose your faith. But Protestants who believe once saved, always saved, don't believe you can lose salvation. They don't believe you can lose it. And they're wrong. They'll never seek forgiveness for sin. They might, because it makes them feel good, but they don't do it out of a sense of necessity. Do you see how the idea of once saved, always saved starts to minimize the great horror of sin. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Look around Catholic churches these days and see how short the lines are for confession. Because people don't really believe in sin anymore. This mentality has crept into the life of the church like a snake and has begun to impact the way we believe our faith, the way many Catholics live their faith. So everyone who dies today, they go to heaven. There's no such thing as purgatory, so they go to heaven. How many of you have been to a Catholic funeral in the last year or two? You go to many of these funerals, at least in the United States, and they talk about whoever the dead person is as though they were a saint. Oh, he's up in heaven now having tea. Oh, he's hanging around with St. Peter, making him a nice scotch. He's probably burning his rear end off in purgatory if he's lucky. If he's lucky. The idea that practically everyone who dies goes to heaven and the only people who don't are like Hitler and Joseph Stalin and Paul Pot. Well, hell must be a pretty lonely place since no one's there. Satan and a few horrible dictators from history, maybe. But everyone else is in heaven. Look around the world today. You really think that everybody who's living today is going to heaven? I don't even know that I'm going to heaven. I pray that I do. I go to confession. I receive Jesus' body and blood. I pray. I dedicate my life to the church as you guys all do in your own particular vocations in the great hope that Jesus keeps his promise because we have chosen to cooperate with his grace and at least try to increase in holiness. That is not a Protestant understanding of Christ not of the Protestants who subscribe to once saved, always saved. There is a horrible pride that infects that sort of theology. It's a, I'm better than everybody else, I'm saved, and you're not. In Calvinist theology, you're simply chosen by God to go to heaven before you even existed. So you, of course, are superior. You are more important than those sinners down there who are all predestined to go to hell. Not Michael. <laughs> this, is, this is what the effect of having bad theology does. And you get bad theology because you start with mistakes. This is why Catholics have to know their faith today. 
you have to know where the Bible came from. You have to understand how it was put together. You don't get to pass on that. You, you don't. I don't. No Catholics get to say, oh, that's not really that important. I'd rather watch you know, uh, uh, MTV or Dancing with the Stars or the Academy Awards. That's not what being Catholic is about. Being Catholic is about being in love with Jesus Christ first sacramentally and then intellectually. What's the greatest commandment? Hear, O Israel, you shall love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. That doesn't leave much time for TV. It doesn't leave much time for drinking. It doesn't leave much time for getting into fights. It doesn't leave much time for amassing great amounts of wealth. It doesn't leave much time for anything. And for Catholics and Protestants, Christians of all sort, who think that they're on the right road because they go to church once a week and they help out with some food shelter, listen to what our Lord said. Everyone who says, Lord, Lord, is not coming into my Father's kingdom. There are lots of people running around saying, Lord, Lord, oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. That's no ticket in. If you love me, you will deny your very self, pick up your cross, and follow me. Anyone who loses his life will find it. Anyone who finds his life will lose it. Nobody gets into heaven without the cross. And there is no cross in simply saying, I accept the Lord Jesus as my personal Savior. It's not a magic incantation. Getting into heaven and being in the presence of the Blessed Trinity is simply an extension, the fulfillment of how you have lived this life here on earth. It isn't a departure. It isn't a change. It's a perfection of it. So somebody who just has kind of a slipshod relationship with God, you know, show up and do some things, and yeah, I go to Mass, and and occasionally say some prayers. Do you love God? Do you love God to the extent that you would die for him? Well, yeah, I die for him. You know, dying a martyr seems like this great kind of romantic sort of death, doesn't it? Die a martyr. Will you live as a martyr every day? That's the call to sainthood. That's the call to sanctification. That's how you apply the fruits of redemption to our lives so that we may gain salvation. Salvation is a process. Redemption was a one-time event that we are, have represented to us every time we go to Holy Mass. And we get to participate in that redemption every time we go to Mass and receive our Lord in Holy Communion. But that must be applied by us. The redemption now must be applied to every individual. But Protestant theology in many, many cases says that redemption and salvation are the same thing. No, they're not. If they were the same thing, St. Paul would never have to have picked up a quill and written a letter. Everything he wrote to them was, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. Go read the first two chapters of the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse. When Jesus himself says to the seven churches of Asia Minor, he reads most of them a riot act. He says to the church at Laodicea, uh, I wish that you were hot or cold, but you are neither. You are lukewarm and the lukewarm I will vomit out of my mouth. These people already believe. So if Martin Luther and John Calvin are right, Jesus is wrong. That's not a bet I'm taking. Once saved, always saved is stupid. It's anti-biblical. It's anti-Christian. 
And if it's anti-Christian, it's anti-Christ. Whenever the scriptures are misinterpreted and that misinterpretation catches fire and people start living their lives according to that, it's the father of lies behind that. It's always the father of lies behind every heresy. And Protestantism is a heresy. That doesn't mean that every individual Protestant is a heretic. Certainly the founders of Protestantism, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, by the way, two of those three guys were Catholic priests. Those guys were heretics. But now 500 years have gone by and many Protestants simply don't know. Why don't they know? Because we haven't told them. We haven't told them enough. That's what evangelization is. But you can't tell what you don't know. There's a grounding philosophical... Um, uh, maxim that says you cannot give what you do not have. We have a prayer at uh, St. Michael's and Real Catholic TV. We're praying to uh, Pope Saint, or, uh, Blessed Pius XII asking him for $10 million to advance all of the work that we do there, be able to hire more people, make more programs, that sort of thing. But uh, does anybody here have $10 million they can give me? <laughs> Just anybody? $10 million? Why not? I don't have it. That's right. You can't give me what you don't have. And we can't share with the world what needs to be shared and given to the world if we don't have it ourselves first. The apostles were able to be martyred. The first Christians were able to be, you know, marched into the Colosseum and the, and the arenas of the empire singing as they're about to have their heads chopped off or burned at the stake or fed to the wild beasts and the lions because they believed it and they were happy to die as martyrs because they'd already lived as martyrs. People don't do these kinds of things at the moment of death. There's another saying, you know, as you live, so shall you die. Deathbed conversions that happen don't happen because of the person on the deathbed. They happen because of the prayers and sacrifices and sufferings of someone else for that person that at the moment of their death, Christ, in answer to this person's prayers, comes to them and brings them the opportunity for salvation, even though for their entire lives or most of their lives they had rejected it. It's a wonderful story uh, about that. There was a, um, a brother and a sister. The brother's name was John, and the sister uh, went off to a convent and became a nun, or woman, woman religious, and her brother John was an atheist and lived his life accordingly and his sister was greatly disturbed at this and she said very early on during her uh, life as a as a nun that all the sufferings and troubles of her life she would offer up to our blessed Lord for the conversion and salvation of her brother and this went on for years and years and years and years and years and no change in John and uh, finally, she was called to the office by her mother superior who told her that her brother John had just died. And she asked what was his condition when he died. She said, well, the report from the nurse was that a priest had arrived at the door of his room uh, in the hospital and offered him last rites. And John spit at the priest, told him to get out, turned his head over, and died. Well, as you might imagine, this caused great distress for the sister. And she was beside herself. She couldn't be, it became a crisis of faith for her. So I've spent my entire life offering up everything for him. And she was so distressed that our Lord took pity on her and appeared to her in a vision and said, I want to show you what really happened. And he made known to her, showed her somehow in her mind or visually in front of her, she became aware that when the priest came to the door and offered last rites and John spit at him and he turned his head over to the wall, that Jesus, in the image of his sacred heart, appeared to John on the wall and said, John, will you spit on me now? And in his last breath, which the nurse did not see, John said, Lord, have mercy on me, and died and was saved. 
deathbed conversions happen because of someone else's efforts. It is a maxim of Catholic theology that the innocent pay for the guilty. We are all sitting here right now as followers of a Jewish preacher from 2,000 years ago. That's why we're all here in this room, because we believe this from 2,000 years ago. It's the only reason we're here. Well, some of you might be neighbors with each other, but the reason you're here is because you believe that this man was the Son of God from 2,000 years ago. He died on the cross for us. The innocent pay for the guilty. This is something far different than Protestant theology that says once you're saved, you're always saved. It doesn't allow for meritorious suffering. It doesn't allow for indulgences. It doesn't allow for communion of saints. It doesn't allow for any of the beauties and treasures and wonders of Almighty God as given to us in the Catholic Church. It's a heresy and it must be fought. I wasn't surprised to hear with the RH bill that uh, shortly after it became, started gaining ground in the uh, uh, Filipino legislature uh, that the National Council of Churches of the Philippines got right behind it. Ten different Protestant uh, bodies got right behind it and support it and push it. When you are not in a state of sanctifying grace, you're in a state of mortal sin. There's no in-between. And if you're in a state of mortal sin, the lights go out. Your intellect is dimmed and you can't see the truth for what it is. People who are in a state of sanctifying grace aren't crazy alcoholics. They're not running around wrecking their families with affairs and, and beating their children and drug addicts and prostitutes. People in, states of sanct in a state of sanctifying grace don't behave that way because they know, they know the reality and the horror of that. And they realize that just because they said some time ago, I believe in Jesus, doesn't mean they can now become a prostitute without any consequences. Either the Catholic Church was established by Jesus Christ to be the bulwark against evil and the means of, the means of salvation for souls, or it wasn't. It's yes or no. A five-year-old can understand that. If that's true, then we must love it, defend it, die for it, live for it, and advance it because that's a gift given to us and we have to give it to everyone else we can come in contact with. If it's not true, then just go home. There's no point being here. There's no point going to Mass. There's no point doing anything if that's not true. So if you believe that, believe it 100%. If you don't believe it, then stop being a hypocrite. So do you believe it? It's a question each one of us has to ask. If I believe it, I believe it 100%. Because we have the warning from our Lord in the first century. We already have the warning. The lukewarm I will vomit out of my mouth. Do not believe this half-heartedly. Do not believe it half-heartedly. Believe it 100% and go out and save the world. And when you run into misguided misinterpretations of Scripture that affect people's eternal salvations, correct them. Don't worry about, oh, people say, oh, you're crazy Catholic, and, oh, there's just sitting, oh, he's trying to jam your morals down, Arthur. Shut up with that stuff. The culture of death jams its values down your throat. Do a little jamming back. This is what it means to be Catholic. It means to take on the world and try to save the world. We don't get to sit around and sit on the sidelines to be out of the game. We have to be in the game, 100% committed. This is a war. 
It is a war for the souls of the human race, the individual souls of the human race. We don't get to sit around and watch this like we're bystanders or watch like we're watching a movie. We're soldiers in these foxholes. And if all of the soldiers aren't fighting, then you're going to take many more casualties than you should. How do you fight? You learn the faith. You love the faith. You live the faith. And you will be persecuted for it. Sometimes a little, sometimes a lot. People will make fun of you. No well, big deal. You know, one day, God willing, everyone in here and all of our loved ones will be in heaven. And imagine the conversations we're going to have with all those first century and second century Christians who were persecuted and thrown to the lions and uh, burned at the stake, you know, in the, uh, uh, the really nice area of Rome, what used to be uh, imperial Rome, the forum area was beautiful. All the buildings were gold and marble, and there was a path from that particular area of the center of Imperial Rome to the Colosseum. And when people would go to games, when Roman citizens would go to the games in the Colosseum at night, well, the path was dark. So what the emperors used to do was take Christians, cover them in tar, put them up on stakes, and light them on fire. And that would light up the way. It was like Roman emperor street lamps. And they would light the way to the Colosseum. So you could go in there and watch the night games with the animals ripping Catholics to shreds, tearing them apart. We're going to meet all of those people, hopefully, one day. Many of us within 50 years. Many of us within 20 years. We're going to see all of those people face to face. Imagine the conversation when you stand around and say, wow, you know, I, well, that was a rough life. I had to defend the faith against my mother-in-law. And she was really mean to me. And she said all kinds of things. And when I came over for dinner, she wouldn't give me dessert because she didn't like me. And we'll be up there saying those kinds of things. And they wrote mean articles about me in newspapers. And then you're going to meet some guy and you're going to say, Hi, my name's George. What's yours? I'm Theodosius. Oh, when did you live? I lived in the second century. Oh, what happened to you? I got eaten by a lion. Oh, well, I guess I'll shut up about my mother-in-law. <laughs> be proud to be Catholic. Love your faith. Realize the tremendous gift you've been given. When you see somebody in error, you don't get to not correct them. Whether they're Catholic or Protestant, or, you don't get to not say anything. You don't get to determine whether the Holy Spirit wants you to say something to this person or wants this person to hear something right now. You don't get to block the will of the Holy Spirit. Even if you say it poorly, even if you stumble around, I don't have any confidence on how to say this stuff, well, get the confidence. Go online. Start reading. Go online. Real Catholic TV. Watch some of the videos. There's hundreds of hours there about the faith. If you can stand to hear my voice anymore, I'm one of the guys that talks on there. Go on there. Go on other places. Read. Read the encyclicals from the popes. They're all there. Everything's there. The whole faith is there. Get a copy of the Catechism, second edition. Read it. When it gets down to the footnotes, spend some time. Go check out what the footnotes say. Educate yourself in the faith. If you love the faith, you will do these things, even if it means, especially if it means reordering your life. Do something different with your life. If you're the member of a garden club and you just have no time for it, well, then get out of the garden club. If you like playing cards every Thursday night and you have no time to learn about the faith, then stop playing cards every Thursday night. If you like cars or clubs or parties or 
hosting this or making fabulous dinners for people. You know what? Go out and get McDonald's and spend the other two hours learning about the faith. No, don't get McDonald's. But this is what it means to be a Catholic today. This is not 50, 60, 70 years ago. This isn't how life is today if you're a Catholic. You just don't say, oh, go see Father. I don't know. Go see Sister. She understands it. I don't know. Go read the letter from the bishop. I'm too busy playing cards. The world is falling apart around us because God is being kicked out of the world. And we have been baptized and confirmed and receive his body and blood every Sunday and oftentimes more than that so that we can be his instruments of salvation in the world. You have been given this gift. I have been given this gift of the Catholic faith. There is no other gift on earth more valuable than this gift because no other gift on earth allows you to receive Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. No other gift on earth allows you to be restored to your baptismal purity in the sacrament of confession. You have been given a tremendous gift, the greatest gift that you can possibly receive this side of death. And to whom much has been given, much will be demanded. Are you supposed to save the world? Yes, you are supposed to save the world. Start in your area of the world. And when you hear something stupid, like once saved, always saved, call them out on it. Particularly if there are other people standing around who are paying attention to that idiocy. When you hear a heresy, defeat it. Every great saint in the history of the church did that. If you love Christ, you will see those heresies as insults to him. Belts across the face denials of the truth that he came to give us. It's not an argument you're having with a person. It's a fight you're having with Satan. Get in the fight. God bless you.